Good evening. Can you all hear me? It is such a pleasure to be here. I came to Elmira, Elmira for the first time last fall for a Twain Symposium and visited Park Church for services on Sunday morning. I never imagined that I would be back within a year in residence at Quarry Farm delivering a lecture in this storied space. This is a testament to how quickly they put people to work around here. <laughs> My special thanks go to Joe Lamack at the Center for Mark Twain Studies, Steve Webb at Quarry Farm, Katie Galvin at the Mark Twain Archive at Elmira College, Rachel Dworkin at the Chemung County Historical Society, and Barb Snedeker, editor of the Diaries of Olivia Langdon, each for their help and support. I work on female abolitionism and have published on the Beecher family, Harriet in particular, so it is a special treat for me to be here today. Today I am focusing on two pieces written by Twain in the years after his last visit to Quarry Farm, but which are deeply informed by his long association with the Langdon family and this culturally important region. Extracts from Adam's Diary, published in 1904, the year of his wife's death in Florence, Italy, and Eve's Diary, published in 1906, two years later. My own interest in Twain and the figure of Eve is built on an obsession I have with the reception history of various female figures from the Hebrew Bible in American literature and how these characters are used as types and foils of female agency, action, and authority. My initial published work has centered on the figure of Esther in the work of writers such as Margaret Fuller, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Henry Adams. Tonight, we will look at Eve's place in Twain's imagination which is part of my larger work on the literary Eve, which ends with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her woman's Bible, which seeks to rewrite the story of Eve from a woman's perspective. Next week, I'll be giving an address in Paris on Herman Melville and the figure of Hagar in his novel Moby Dick and in his epic poem Clarel for the Melville International Symposium. I see these typological women dancing all over the pages of 19th century American literature and can hardly contain my enthusiasm. They have served as rich entrees into the intellectual, cultural, theological, and social concerns of the writers who have invoked them and have been a source of unending fascination for me. And so I've put just a couple of images, artistic images from the period. These are not American. This is Rodin in 1886, his sculpture of Eve, um, which is based on the initial rendering of Eve um, at the gates of hell. And this uh, painting of Adam and Eve by Edvard Munch uh, comes from 1909, so a couple of years after the diary is written. But I like it because um, it sets Adam and Eve sort of in the period uh, in terms of their clothing and uh, the setting. And so we're going to see the importance of that uh, in just a little bit. Uh, and I've talked for a bit about uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the Woman's Bible, which is published about a decade before Twain writes these diaries, um, uh, and is very important uh, consideration on the topic of Eve. All right. Extracts from Adam's Diary and Eve's Diary, originally printed as two separate volumes, were published together in 1906 by Harper and Brothers in New York and London at Mark Twain's request under the title The Private Life of Adam and Eve, being extracts from their diaries translated from the original manuscript. We learn much about Twain's conception of Eve in both, and it is imperative that we consider them together, in part because Twain believed that they scored po points against each other. So, if not bound together, some of the points would not be perceived. There is a larger corpus of material dealing with Adam and Eve, what Stanley Rodwin calls the Adamic Diaries, including for my purposes, passages from Eve's diary and the autobiography of Eve, but these remained unpublished at his death. Unlike the humorous text we will look at this evening, the latter work involves more pathos and complexity, though we will see a few strains here. Twain is writing about Eve in the 1890s and 1900s against several backdrops. The biblical text of Genesis, the work of others writing on Eve, including Milton, Shelley, Hawthorne, and especially Stanton, who engages the story of Eve as the linchpin of her woman's Bible. Debates about creation and evolution in the face of Darwin's writings, where the figure of Eve is used to bolster the argument for the divine origin of humankind, and the larger social question of female place and purpose 
amidst the campaign for the franchise. Tonight, I hope to examine with you the deployment of Eve in the time of Twain and consider the concerns Clemens takes up in these two diaries devoted to our biblical parents. These volumes taken together combine at least a triptych of ideas, a loving homage to his beloved spouse, a reflection on religious debates about evolution relative to ecclesiastical and social order, and an expression of the political concerns of women called suffragettes for the first time that year to mark their direct engagement in their quest for the vote. And here is um, Mark and Livy on the porch at Quarry Farm in 1903, just a year before her passing, and one of the illustrations from Eve's diary that seemed uh, symbiotic to me. The first thing to note um, about the landscape of Eden in the hands of Twain is that Twain sets it in the native soil of his wife, upstate New York, and more specifically where they first lived as a couple, in Buffalo. When Clemens first composed the extracts from Adam's diary in the winter of 1892 to 93, it did not include references to the local scenery. But finances were tight, and when it did not get placed for publication immediately, he revised it to appear in Niagara Book, a souvenir of the 1893 Buffalo Pan American Exposition. In later editions, he wanted Niagara Falls purged. But it appeared in the first book version anyway by Harper and Brothers in 1904 and in subsequent editions. Joseph McCullough has defended the Niagara version, suggesting that the waterfall references serve a dual purpose and deepen the theological implications, an assessment with which I concur. Adam plays in Niagara Falls and goes on hunting and fishing expeditions in Buffalo. In the first few pages of Adam's diary, we learn that Eve has named the Garden of Eden Niagara Falls Park and has put up signs warning people to stay off the grass and directing them toward the Whirlpool, Goat Island, and the Cave of Winds. She has also warned Adam from playing in the falls, for it makes her shudder. He describes going over the falls in a barrel and in a tub and playing in the whirlpool in a fig leaf costume, fig leaf costume which got much damaged. His episode with the barrel surely alludes to the real woman, Annie Edson Taylor, an impoverished school teacher who did just that in 1901. The Queen of the Mist survived, but did not profit as much as she had hoped from the stunt. Twain profited more from Adam's run over Niagara, publishing the diaries repeatedly, but it was also deemed a literary dissent by critics. In his 1904 review in The Bookman, Henry Thurston Peck suggests that there is something unutterably pathetic about a book like Mark Twain's Extracts from Adam's Diary. It shows just how far a man who was once a great humorist can fall. Mm. The presence of Niagara Falls in the narrative is not just comic. In the 19th century, the falls become an important destination for writers who, like Margaret Fuller in Summer on the Lakes, sought creative inspiration there. For Henry Adams, Niagara becomes a source of tremendous revelation for his character, Esther Dudley, in his novel, Esther, privately published under the pseudonym Frances Snow Compton in 1885. When Esther and her friend Catherine arrive at Niagara Falls, they discover that where men interpret the falls as the fall of Adam, a fall from innocence to a life of toil and sorrow, redeemed only through male sacrifice and martyrdom, women may interpret the falls as the fall of Eve, a fall brought on by knowledge, which leads to greater physical and spiritual self-consciousness and transformation. Niagara Falls comes to represent something more than the fall of woman. Catherine says it best, the fall is a woman. Niagara is in fact the face of female revelation, exposing the truth of her divine existence to herself and others. Esther comes to see herself not as a woman who is falling or going over the falls, but the female voice of the fall, a female torrent of spiritual life, strength, and salvation. The truth of Niagara becomes a part of her, for she has become the female Niagara, a plunging, running, piercing wall of water, a woman who falls into a great reservoir of truth, even immortal truth. In this text, Niagara becomes the voice of the eternal woman. In Adam's diary, Eve is painted as an intrusion on Adam's solitude condition also prized for Adam by Milton in Paradise Lost, because she is always talking, and it is a close rather than a distant sound, right at his ear, first on one side, and then on the other. Like God, 
Eve seems to be omnipresent. Indeed, it may be that she takes his place in the diaries, which, like the book of Esther, exclude the presence of God altogether. It also turns out that she has a voice and she knows how to use it. In the hands of Twain, Eve already possesses what Esther Dudley must painstakingly discover. The female has a voice that is a torrent of life, strength, and salvation. When Twain finished the account of Eve, he declared, Eve's diary is finished. I've been waiting for her to speak. In these diaries, I argue that the falls are central to the thrust of the work. As Broadwin has noted, Twain drew artistic strength and meaning from the basic moral and ontological suppositions or assumptions implicit in the fall. But of course, it takes the form of a joke, or in this case, a chestnut, which is a term for an aged and moldy joke, perhaps Twain's self-deprecating self-reference. It was also an important cultural reference to the collapse of the American chestnut tree along the eastern seaboard. This ecologically devastating loss wiped out most of the four billion chestnut trees then extant, caused by eight Asian bark fungus first discovered at the Bronx Zoo in 1904, the year Adam's Diary is first published. This was a natural fall of epic proportions. are out of order there. You can see just how large these chestnut trees were. They really were uh, magnificent and their loss was, uh, was tremendous. At just the moment when Eve partakes of the fruit, the apples she had been hankering after and threatening to eat, Adam remembers that he told a joke to himself. And what was the private joke? Adam imagined the falls in reverse, tumbling up rather than down. It would be a deal more wonderful to see it tumble up there. As with Fuller and Adams, the falls take on an important metaphorical meaning for Twain. Instead of a fall down, Adam and Eve's actions lead, at least imaginatively, to a fall up, an advance rather than a decline for which they are both responsible. Not only has the forbidden fruit been misidentified, it is a chestnut rather than an apple, or a chestnut as well as an apple, so has the meaning of the fall. It is progress, not regression, at least on an aspirational level. His rejection of the theology of the fall as understood since Milton was pointed and overt, but it did not keep him from returning continually to this story. In a word, he was haunted by this mythic narrative, did not agree with it, and had no idea how to get away from it. I wanna show you a piece that I found at the Corning Museum last weekend. I don't know how well you can see it, um, this piece is contemporary, it's from 1988, but the presence of apples on this work entitled The Temptation of Eve just demonstrates that Twain was not able to get very far with the chestnut image. <laughs> when the fall does come, Adam describes the aftermath of the fall from the perspective of the animals. Every beast was destroying its neighbor, which also foreshadows the fate of Abel at the hands of Cain, whose birth forms another hilarious part of the story. Unable to identify the species of the thing named Cain, which Eve has brought him, Cain, or Eve has taken to naming everything, he goes from thinking him a fish, to a kangaroo, to a bear, finally to a parrot. I encountered a bear last week on the hills of Tanglewood, and I decided to call him Cain. <laughs> Adam cannot figure out where his child has come from. He also cannot figure out where his wife has come from. At one point he exclaims, she told me she was made out of a rib taken from my body. This is at least doubtful, if not more than that. I have not missed any rib. Here is the voice of Eve standing in for the voices of Protestant and Catholic theologians who insist that the skeletal creation of Eve, a female from a rib, demonstrates the divine origin of humans, down from God rather than up from an evolving earth. Though Martin Luther has debunked, had debunked the rib theory as an outrageous absurdity centuries before Twain openly questioned it, Eve's biological relation to Adam remains at the center of the evolutionary debate which raged in the late 19th century. During this period, Dermot Finnegan suggests that the histor historical veracity of the formulation of the first woman became a significant concern for Christian thinkers, eager on the one hand to accommodate or combat evolutionary accounts of human origins, and on the other to maintain theological and social doctrines tied to the Genesis text describing Eve's position. 
several key issues were at stake in these debates over the creation and position of Eve, including monogamous marriage, the indissoluble character of the marital union, the subordinate position of wives, the exclusion of women from positions of ecclesiastical authority, and the domestic sphere as woman's allotted place. The anxiety over Eve clearly concerned much more than a rib. This religious argument was articulated as early as 1873 from the Supreme Court by Justice Joseph P. Bradshaw in denying Myrna Blackwell admission to the bar of law. He said, man is and should be woman's protector and defender. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex unfits it for many of the occupations of life. The constitution of the family organization which is found in divine ordinances, read marriage, indicates that the domestic is the domain of women. The paramount destiny and mission of women, mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. And this is from the gavel of the Supreme Court, not from the pulpit. Indeed, the threat to traditional gender roles implicit in the scientific rereading of the creation account caused great concern to American Christians, particularly Presbyterians. And remember, that's the environment um, in which Twain is steeped growing up in Hannibal, Missouri, Southern Presbyterians. In a pointed defense of the supernatural rather than the natural creation of woman, in the Princeton Review in 1878, Reverend John T. Duffield drew on the larger context of the Genesis account and the supporting words of the Apostle Paul to confirm that Adam was formed before Eve and that woman was created not just from man, but for man. This ordering of the sexes was perhaps more important than whether the creation of Eve could be harmonized with evolutionary science. As the Congregationalist George Frederick Wright noted in an essay on the Bible and science in 1880, there is no difficulty at all in adjusting the language of the first chapters of Genesis to that expressing the derivative origin of species until you come to the story of the creation of Eve out of the rib of Adam. What seemed to be ribbing the men most, however, was the presence of female preachers and female reformers, mostly but not exclusively Quakers, who wanted to preach from their pulpits, leading to controversy and trials for those preachers who had allowed them to speak. Southern Presbyterians were especially concerned that the meddling with Eve's creation would lend support to the cause of women's rights in general, and women preachers in particular. Here is the always talking voice that Twain's Adam dreaded, not distant, but within close range, a voice from which he often sought to exile himself, even in the garden. In the face of Eve's rage for explaining, Adam is left to lament that his life used to be so pleasant and quiet. Inverting the creation account, he admits that he gets no rest on Sunday with Eve around and is left just trying to pull through, which he mentions numerous times. At multiple points, he makes plans to emigrate away from Eden and Eve. It must then be viewed with a touch of irony that Twain's funeral sermon delivered here at Park Church was written by a woman, Annis Ford Eastman, an ordained minister who shared the pulpit with her husband, Sam Eastman. Either that or a demonstration of how much Twain's Adam had evolved after the fall. While most American Protestants in the late 19th century were able to reconcile the creation of the earth and Adam with a hypothesis of gradual evolution, the creation of Eve was finally understood as a miraculous exception to the general rule of animals. Any other explanation would risk unraveling biblical gender norms. The response of the church to the female crusade for rights, including the vote, was to work instead for the restoration of the great original law of paradise that kept men and women well-ordered in separate spheres. In the hands of Twain, Adam is adamant about such spheres in the Garden of Eden. Adam takes every opportunity to make himself scarce. He is an adult version of Huck Finn. He goes off to fish and hunt, makes plans to move. At one point, he even builds himself a solitary dwelling to escape Eve's presence. She is annoying. She talks too much. She knows too much. And she runs around showing off her ability to give everything in sight a name. That ability is indicative of the knowledge, intuition, and even revelation to which she is privy in their supposedly idyllic state. And yet, in both diaries, Eve approaches Adam with a desire to be useful to him, to keep him company, to bolster his confidence, to keep him from embarrassment, to refrain from pointing out his faults. When he builds a shelter, she wants to join him there. 
but that would bother him, so he closes the door on her. This she describes as her first sorrow. But when night came, I could not bear the lonesomeness and went to the new shelter which he had built to ask him what I had done that was wrong and how I could mend it and get back his kindness again. But he put me out in the rain and it was my first sorrow. For Eve, sorrow is a new feeling and her first sorrow is the sorrow of loneliness and rejection. I'm reminded of Twain's line that the secret source of humor itself is not joy, but sorrow. It is important to note that in Twain's rendering, Eve is acquainted with both knowledge and sorrow in the garden, not after being cast out of the garden. Indeed, he demonstrates that Eve can be cast out while in the garden. She is a deeply interpersonal character and clearly thrives on talking, connecting, and helping, but is deemed a nuisance, a disturber of the peace, and is shut out anyway. This may be the height of disharmony between the two of them. Adam here is not too different from the Presbyterian preachers intent on excluding the voice of women in their congregations and other public realms. They too are shut out. As I read this part of the account again, I was left to wonder, where is the peace of woman that has autonomy, is not dependent on the approbation of others, and therefore cannot be shut out, either then or now? On one level, Adam is charmed that Eve has taken up with the snake, for the snake talks and can provide company for Eve. Now Adam can rest alone in his hut. Eve learns from the snake that eating the fruit will bring a great and fine and noble education, or in other words, knowledge, though we see that Eve is already privy to some understandings. Adam warns Eve that partaking will also bring death. I advised her to keep away from the tree. She said she wouldn't. I foresee trouble, will emigrate. In, need, in Eden, escape is always Adam's modus operandi. The reality of death for Eve was less a problem and more a solution, for she had already noticed that the tigers and the buzzards were ill-suited to their vegetarian diets in Eden. They longed for fresh meat. While Adam protests that we cannot overturn the whole scheme to accommodate the buzzard, he follows the lead of Eve and eats the apple because, he says, he was hungry. He is led by a primal physical need. Food is essential to survival. In fact, he notes that principles of any sort have no real force except one is well fed. In these diaries, Twain's response to religious concerns over evolutionary science covers more than just an anxiety over Eve. The hunger of Adam and Eve betrays what can only really be expressed as a need for survival. Rather than draw a bright line between humans and animals in the text, Twain draws them together into a cycle of birth, maturation, decay, death, and renewal. Nowhere is this more clear than in the coats of skin story. Rather than setting up this episode as reactionary, they eat the fruit, discover their nakedness, and cover their shame, he sets it in motion as a natural continuation of the lives of living beings. Remember that Adam first experienced the fall from the perspective of the animals. Every beast was destroying his neighbor. That violence brought death. Adam and Eve, now acting as buzzards themselves, crept down to where the wild beast battle had been and collected some skins. Adam adds that he made Eve patch together a couple of suits proper for public occasions. They are uncomfortable, it is true, but stylish, and that is the main point of clothes. In this world of suffering for fashion and the survival of the fittest, the story of the creation and fall becomes inseparable from the dynamics of evolution. By putting on coats of skin, they were not just covering their bodies, they were demonstrating that they too are animals. Twain conflates creation and evolution in yet another way when he introduces a brontosaurus into the camp of Eden. Adam explains that Eve regarded it as an acquisition, but I considered it a calamity. That is a good sample of the lack of harmony that prevails in our view of things. We have already seen that Twain sets Eden in the native country of his own Eve, his wife, Livy Langdon, with allusions to the place where they began their married lives. Here he is also playing on the prehistory of the place where they returned in the summer for more than 20 years and where he did much of his creative work. Though dinosaur fossils have not, to my knowledge, been discovered in Elmira, the region was rife with tusks of woolly mastodons, so much so that the Seneca name for the valley, Chemung, relates to the abundance of such tusks along the banks of what is now the Chemung River. 
for twain, evolution and creation are part of the same story. And so I've paired two images, one of Eve riding the brontosaurus and um, an image from the historical society during a kind of a public humanities campaign with uh, Twain on top of a woolly mastodon. The narrative of knowledge, sorrow, death, survival, and change that prevails in these diaries takes another interesting turn once they find themselves enmeshed in a world replete with ruin. Sixty years earlier, the writer Nathaniel Hawthorne placed his new Adam and Eve in just such a space, the remnants of civilization, and called it Eden. For Twain, the world beyond Niagara Falls Park also has its appeal. Out of the garden, Adam draws close to Eve. Disharmony turns to greater harmony. In his diary, he confides, I find that she is a good deal of a companion. I see that I should be lonesome and depressed without her, now that I have lost my property. Another thing, she says it is ordered that we work for our living hereafter. She will be useful. I will superintend. The fall has brought longing, desire, and needs that did not once exist. When Adam once, what Adam once shunned, he now approaches. In a lonely world, Adam and Eve can share their company, their purpose, and their suffering with one another. They become interdependent. The plural we, introduced by Eve at the beginning of Adam's diary, can now become a reality. But Twain was just wise enough and cynical enough to realize that experience in a world governed by the survival of the fittest is also going to involve exploitation. In the garden, life was full of leisure, and Adam wanted to do nothing more than to be left alone. Out of the garden, life is full of work, and Adam now, and Adam now realizes that Eve, once a nuisance, will be useful. He cleverly decides that his work will be to superintend or oversee the work of others, principally the work of Eve. Adam has lost the property that was once his, but he quickly makes up for that loss by acquiring Eve as property. We learn from Eve's diary that she is constantly looking for ways to be useful, well before their notice of eviction from Eden. Adam now preys on that desire to serve his own purposes. The anxiety over Eve has quickly turned to the abuse of her abilities. Eve's willingness to aid Adam at seemingly any cost does have shades of martyrdom, a theme, a theme that Twain explores and glorifies more extensively as a transcendent mode above the depravity of man in the personal recollections of Joan of Arc, published a decade before Eve's diary. Consider this passage from Eve. I tried to get him some of those apples, but I cannot learn to throw straight. I failed, but I think the good intention pleased him. They are forbidden, and he says I shall come to harm, but so I come to harm through pleasing him. Why should I care for that harm? Twain clearly recognizes that the sacrificial stance, however noble, would be exploited. The 19th century cult of domesticity had professionalized the job of homemaker, but women increasingly worked for pay as well as school teachers, librarians, and nurses, thanks to their experience in the Civil War. They also worked in numerous sweated industries, shirt making, nail making, uh, chain making and shoe stitching. Rural women in New York, New Jersey, and New England had been doing such sweat work for more than half a century, increasingly replaced by Irish and other immigrant women. Women striking for better working conditions can be traced to the Lowell Mills as early as the 1830s. But on June 3, 1900, local unions came together to found large entities like the International Lady Garment Workers Union that could make demands, launch protests, and strike en masse. When Clara Lemlech led a crowd of strikers in 1909 in New York City, she exclaimed, I had fire in my mouth. Another strike in 1910, the year of Twain's death, often referred to as the uprising of the 20,000, also pushed for new laws to protect the organized labor of women. After the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, which burned 146 workers, mostly young women and girls who were paid low wages, the union gained much broader support. And this is a picture of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory before the fire. In Eve's diary, we learn that Eve creates fire in the garden. She wants to tell Adam about her invention to raise herself in his esteem, but is concerned that he may think that her creation is merely beautiful and not useful. 
Delighted with her discovery, she is found playing with fire on numerous occasions until the fire gets out of control and burns part of the landscape. Eve takes on numerous roles in Twain's text, and one of them is that of woman wisdom, who, like the writer of Proverbs, transforms experience into axioms of truth and insight. When the fire burns, she creates this one. Burnt experiment shuns the fire. Her experiment with fire also leads to fear, a horrible sensation that Adam cannot understand because he has not discovered it yet. And here are two illustrations from Eve's diary. On the left, Eve playing with fire, and um, on the right, Adam um, reviewing the remnants when the fire gets out of hand. Niagara Falls Park is, both, is a realm of both anticipation and actualization, warning of what happens when you play with fire and watching its realization. It must have felt that way for the young women who protested for safe working conditions only to watch with horrible fear as their cohort perished in the flames. Eve wanted fire to be both beautiful and useful. She may not have understood that she, like the fire, would be regarded and often oppressed for both her beauty and her usefulness. From the outset, Eve realized that she was an experiment, but quickly determined that she wanted to be the principal experiment. And I intend to do it too, she says. For this privilege, she came to see that eternal vigilance is the price of supremacy. Female labor laws and protections were an important feature of a much larger and longer nationwide campaign for women's rights. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton, author of the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments, confessed, every right achieved was contended for inch by inch. In that document, produced more than a decade before the Civil War, Stanton and others dared to dream of rights for women at home, in society, in the church, and in politics. Their bold declaration even included a hotly contested demand for a public voice in the form of suffrage. The desire of Eve to be useful meant that the movement for women's rights was developed first in the service of freedom for others, primarily Africans enslaved in America. Female abolitionists such as Lydia Maria Child, Angelina and Sarah Grimke, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Sarah Parker Raymond, Sojourner Truth, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper often discussed, debated, and delivered speeches on the woman question in the fervent hope that their work seeking justice and representation for others would translate into their own freedom from oppression. When, in the wake of the war, the adoption of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution limited the franchise to male citizens, they realized that they would have to fight a more focused battle for their own freedom from servitude. That focused battle came very close to home when Twain married Olivia Langdon in 1870. The Langdon family were committed abolitionists who also devoted resources to the education of women, helping to found Elmira College in 1855. Olivia was surrounded by and deeply involved in these strains of social activism. Letters both before and after her marriage reveal her strong views on suffrage. One written, the letter she and Samuel wed speaks volumes. In a missive to Mary Mason Fairbanks, she declares simply, I am woman's rights. This expression of the embodiment of a cause within oneself is mirrored in Eve's experiences in the waters of Eden. Adam declares in his diary that Eve fell in the pond yesterday when she was looking at herself, which she is always doing. Adam casts Eve in the role of Narcissus, infatuated with her own image. But from the perspective of Eve, what she sees in the water is not herself, but her sister, an extension of herself with whom she makes common cause. It talks when I talk, it is sad when I am sad, it comforts me with its sympathy, it says, do not be downhearted, you poor friendless girl, I will be your friend. It is a good friend to me, and my only one. It is my sister. Adam is unwilling to listen to her talk, offering the excuse that Eve had such a rage for explaining, so she turns instead to her own reflection in the water for company, for solace, and for understanding. And there is an image of her from the diary looking at her own reflection. Eve's rage for explaining and her ability to see in herself other female lives allows us to see her in the cause of suff rage, which derives its meaning 
from the medieval practice of prayer, extended to requests for assistance, then to a supporting vote, and finally, the vote itself. In the United States Constitution, 1787, it suggests an inalienable right to vote. With the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments, that right is extended to all American men, but not to American women. Unlike Twain's Adam, who tries and fails to operate by coercion, Eve seeks to persuade. Her requests for assistance and her requests to be of assistance, combined with her core connection to her sister or sisters, makes her a suffragette, a term that marked women's direct engagement in their request for the vote. Coined the same year, Twain wrote Eve's diary. Suffragists become suffragettes, determined to transform their suffering and their rage into inalienable legal rights. In the diaries, uh, the writer Ursula Le Guin does see a certain advocacy at work. Mark Twain, she says, is always on the side of the underdog. And though he believed it was and must be a man's world, he knew that women were the underdogs in it. This fine sense of justice is what gives both of the diaries their moral complexity. One of the few words that Adam coins in his diary, justification, enigma is the other one, turns in the hands of Eve toward the quest for justice. The declaration by Olivia that I am woman's rights come from, comes from a letter she and Samuel wrote together to their friend Mary Fairbanks, a letter which anticipates in its give and take the structures of the diaries of Adam and Eve. Olivia Langdon Clemens was indeed a representation of women's rights, engaged as a local networker and financial supporter of suffrage activity in Elmira, centered right here at Park Church and nearby at the Jervis Langdon home. Olivia was in touch with Anna Elizabeth Dickinson, who used the Langdon home as a base of operations when in town, and with Isabella Beecher Hooker, who founded the New England Suffrage Association and was a sister to the Reverend Tom and Beecher, who preached here. She also interacted with Crystal and Max Eastman, the children of Samuel and Annis Ford Eastman, who were prominent supporters, all of them, of the suffrage movement. Sam Eastman understood the plight of women in a world of buzzards. Man's protections has been such as the vultures give to lambs. A woman is not free, nor ever can be, until she first until she herself has the ballot and a voice in the laws that fix her religious, civic, and social status. A major goal of the local movement was to enlist the support of Twain, who could provide remarkable publicity to the cause of suffrage, given his own authorial celebrity. He became a strong advocate, one of his many evolutions over the course of his marriage uh, to Livy, and endorsements like this one in his 1874 speech, the temperance insurrection became useful to their campaign. Women find themselves voiceless in the making of laws and the election of officers to execute them. Born with brains, born in the country, educated, having large interests at stake, they find their tongues tied and their hands fettered. While every ignorant, whiskey-drinking, foreign-born savage in the land may hold office, make laws, degrade the dignity of the former, and break the latter at his own sweet will. In extending the suffrage to women, this country could lose absolutely nothing and may gain a great deal. His mention of ignorant, whiskey-drinking savages in the land is more than colorful language. Rather, it is an allusion or an allusion to the major threat suffrage faced from the temperance movement. The teetotaler campaign was so anathema to many, mostly men, that they resisted giving, giving women the vote for fear there's that word again, fear, that it would mean the enactment of prohibition. Indeed, the Elmira branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, formed in 1885, came to dominate women's political activity in the area for the next 25 years. Suffrage took a back seat to the platform of temperance, prison reform, and education. This also gave the anti-suffragists a chance to establish themselves. Local efforts were spearheaded by Mrs. W. W. Gregg, who suggested that suffrage is sought by a small but noisy minority that will bring discord and menace to their homes. The suffrage movement then moved west, returning to New York only after the Clemens were gone. When it was finally ratified nationwide in 1920, it went almost hand in glove with the Volstead Act, which enforced prohibition across the country. And here are just a few images of some of these newly coined suffragettes um, after 
1906, this is 1908. And this is Emmeline Pankhurst, who, who is the one who comes up with the term. Um, I just uh, thought she was worth mentioning and noting that though Twain had died in 1910, uh, she comes, she's a British uh, suffragette, and she comes to America speaking in Hartford in 1913, which is when things really do heat up. Um, neither Livy nor Sam lived to see the passage of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. The rather genteel arrangement in their marriage belonged to history by the time the gears were really set in motion in Chemung County between 1913 and 1915, when they hoped a state constitutional convention would be held to amend the state constitution since the legislature was immovable on the question. Elmira was the center of that suffrage activity in the southern tier. Chemung County voted for the suffrage amendment by a small margin, but it was defeated statewide by over 100,000 votes. Two years later, the New York State Legislature passed a suffrage amendment that was then put out to the voters. In a reversal of 1915, it passed statewide by over 100,000 votes, but lost in Chemung County. Mm -hmm. Women in New York were then granted the franchise three years before it became an inalienable right for women across the nation. All right. It has already been established by Laura Scandera Trombley and other scholars that Twain was at his creative best in the company of women. They provided him stories, edited his work, sparked his imagination, and offered an environment conducive to his literary output. In 1905, Twain wrote in a letter to Elizabeth Jordan that Olivia, his wife, edited all my manuscripts, beginning this labor of love a year after we were married, continuing it for 36 years. In turn, he was supportive of Olivia's suffragist friends, believed it was just for women to vote, advocated for equality of the sexes, did not doubt female intelligence or capacity, but he did still seem to harbor some concern about the impropriety of women in the public arena. Much as clerics had argued that the moral superiority of women should not be sullied by the vulgarity of the world, Twain did seem to want to keep Olivia near the hearth. He appears to have needed her there, professionally as well as personally. Once Twain, in the guise of Adam, decided after the fall to permit Eve entrance to his shelter, he did not really want to let her out again. What had been deep disharmony in the Garden of Eden became an almost obsessive quest for her presence. His courtship letter to Olivia expressed this vision with a pun, for are, we, for are not we twain one flesh? Eve's diary, published two years after the passing of his beloved Livy, functions as an homage to her. After all these years, I see that I was mistaken about Eve in the beginning, says Adam. It is better to live outside the garden with her than inside it without her. Le Guin suggests that over the course of the diaries, Eve has not changed much, or yeah, Eve has not changed much, but she has changed Adam profoundly. Eve was always awake. Extracts from Adam's diary published the year of her death may have been an, an opportunity for Twain to reflect on how his position toward women and particularly his wife, had evolved and grown. Blessed be the chestnut that brought us near together and taught me to know the goodness of her heart and the sweetness of her spirit. He became open to the world of women. He must have realized then, if not before, that without Olivia and the circle of his family, his experience was an emotional fall, as dramatic as the physical one at Niagara. Though the description of her goodness and sweetness coupled with the attractive and innocent purity of the Lester Ralph illustrations, does not provide an expansive definition of female depth or complexity. Still, his overarching portrait of Eve is surprisingly nuanced. She is an active force who thinks and speaks for herself. She reaches for the stars and has a passion for the beautiful at the core of her being. Indeed, he has discovered that Eve is both beautiful and useful, not just in practical matters like saving Adam from embarrassment and wounded pride, but also ethereal ones, like serving as an important source of inspiration and saving him. I do not let him see that I am aware of his defeat, says Eve. As Le Guin notes, Eve is the innocent troublemaker whose loving anarchism 
ruins his mindless, self-sufficient, authoritarian Eden and saves him from it. His final tribute to his Eve, the woman who made his life successful, profitable, and so much more than a mode of adventurous abandon and survival, however well that narrative sold from roughing it to Huck Finn to Innocence Abroad to a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court to life on the Mississippi, this uh, was this profound confession at Eve's grave. Wherever she was, wheresoever she was, there was Eden. Thank you.